back. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our work session, which today is on the Maryland School Assessment Results, which uh, were released recently. Um, we made the decision this year to hold this discussion in a work session so that we can have more discussion, we can um, get more interaction among the members and with the staff, and, and really go into the, into the uh, results in more detail than you generally can in a business meeting type format. So I want to thank Dr. Wilcox and the staff for being willing to do that. Uh, I know board members are anxious to see what the results are, ask questions, and, and learn what we know. So I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I think first I want to um, share with you that we'll walk through this at whatever pace you would like. We'll take questions when you want to ask them. Um, but you should know some time ago when we got our preliminary or embargoed results, um, Quite honestly, I was, I was very concerned. I was very concerned for two reasons. One, I saw um, uh, some of our scores slip in some areas that we had spent a great deal of time with. But also, I was not aware of what had happened around the state at that time. Um, subsequently, we've learned that scores across the state declined almost 6%. Um, so we had a fairly significant drop in the state. Our drops were, quite honestly, about in that same significance range, maybe a little bit uh, better uh, in some areas than the state, maybe a little bit worse in some areas. So we're going to walk through that with you today, uh, show you uh, how we have done. Um, but quite honestly, I want to say to you that, well, I'm concerned because I don't like the trend of going backwards. I'm also not as concerned as you might think I should be because we are in the major change of our curriculum. Uh, we are working very hard to move towards a common core curriculum. There are some places within the areas of mathematics and English language arts where the kids are not even exposed to the teaching that is then being tested on the MSAs or the HSAs. Um, I think it is unfair to our teachers and I think it is unfair to our students then for the superintendent of schools to harangue them, to beat them up, to walk all over them uh, given the good effort that they have. That said, I'm not sure the larger community would share that. I'm hoping that those of you who are you know, closely affiliated with these results can help us to share the word that we are a system that continues to get better, um, but we are a system that has some significant challenges given our demographics and quite honestly given some of the reluctance of some to change, um, which is causing some problems. I would tell you that when you look at the data and you look at a school by school basis, one of the other things that you see is there are some schools that not, who traditionally have not, not done as well as others who did better this time than you might have thought. Um, and on the surface, that might be a great thing. On the underside, uh, as a superintendent, I'm looking at, are they good because they're still teaching to the old MSA? And so did their score rise or staying the same? Was that a result of the fact that they have not fully embraced the Common Core? And next year is going to be a real problem for them when we make the switch to the park assessments. So we have a lot of churn in the district right now. Um, but I think it's important that we continue to talk about scores and what they mean. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Domain. Um, but before I turn it over to Dr. Domain, I want to tell you, you know, when we hired Dr. Domain as the Chief Academic Officer, uh, I shared a lot of accolades about her and her skills. I shared that she had held numerous positions in East Baton Rouge. Um, and most of you, I think, maybe had a little in the back of your mind, but she's at a high school right now. She was at Bel Air High School. And will that translate to the district office position? And I think most of you gave me the benefit of the doubt, but I want to share something with you that I just found out is that Bel Air High School was a high school that was persistently um, troubled in the Louisiana uh, state assessments. Uh, Dr. Domain was sent there to turn their school around. Uh, just last week, Dr. Domain got notice from her friends that the school district was holding a press conference that Bel Air was released from state control. They were out of uh, academic danger and then in fact great things were happening for kids there. Uh, that's but one example of her leadership with a caring committed group of folks. So Dr. Domain, I know you're particularly proud of her. She actually came into my room and she was like walking on the air. <laughs> but it was one of those terrible things where she had such a private celebration because there's nobody there to really celebrate with her. So I wanted to make sure today you understood um, that she right now, um, at least in Louisiana, is thought of as a great academic officer. And I think you'll see in a moment that why we hired her. So, Dr. Domain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to share with you this morning uh, the results from our MSA uh, assessments. And there are 
several things on the, the table this morning that we would like to accomplish in addition to sharing those most recent results with you we want to compare those results with what has been happening historically uh, with our children we want to talk about some contributing factors to the results that we have and and we are very deliberately phrasing these as contributing factors because in education, as you know, it is very difficult to do a root cause analysis and say that there is a single uh, cause for the effects that we get into the classroom because of the many variables that exist. But we would like to share some strategies that we have in mind and that we have been sharing uh, with uh, staff and principals to see about developing a cycle of continuous improvement and then of course we will solicit your feedback as we help to refine the strategies that we think to put into place. I will say that my work here is a little bit different than my work has been in Louisiana. Um, the great challenge here is moving from good to great. Uh, it's not simply and some would take offense to using simply turn around. It isn't simply turn around, but it is challenging um, a, a county that is performing at pretty good levels to move to even greater levels. I think that you will see that in the data that we will share with you on this morning and uh, we'll take some time simply to refine what it is that we're doing and to share that with you. With that, um, Maureen Margovich um, will share with you. Um, the first slide here is the elementary reading results broken down by proficiency level. When you look at the, the column to the right, that is 2013, I do want to note, as they did at the state, that this does not include any mod. Uh, we do not have mod MSA anymore. So, whereas previous years included mod numbers, these do not. These are all regular MSA numbers. Our proficiency rate overall, so that would include the proficient and advanced scores, is 82.7%. The Maryland pass rate was at 86.4%, so we are 3.7 percentage points lower than the Maryland percent. The proficiency rate decreased 4.3% from 2012 to 2013, and the advanced scores decreased 2.9 percentage points from 2012 to 2013. If we look at this historically, um, the advanced scores would be similar to that with, which we saw in 2007, and the basic would be similar to what we saw in 2006. The next slide is the middle level reading MSA results. The overall proficiency rate for middle school reading was 86.5. This is above the Maryland pass rate of 83.4 by 3.1 percentage points. Our proficiency rate increased 1.3 percentage points from 2012. Our advanced increased 0.9 percentage points. This is the best advanced that we've ever had um, since the inception of the test. We move next to elementary math. The proficiency rate for elementary math was 83.9 approximately. This is just about even with the Maryland state proficiency rate of 83.9. Our advance did decrease though 10.2 percentage points and our proficiency rate was down 4.1 percentage points from 2012. We can compare that again historically. Our advanced has moved back to 2007 rates and our proficiency has moved back to about 2006 proficiency rates. Our middle level math, the proficiency was at 81.8% this compares to the Maryland pass rate of 72.2. We are 9.6 percentage points higher than the state in middle level math. Even with this, our percentage of our percentage pro proficiency rate decreased 3.1 percentage points from 2012. 
and our advanced fell 6.3 percentage points from 2012. We moved back just a little bit here um, to about 2011 for our basic and 2010 for our advanced. Did you have any questions about those four slides? So at this point, um, Maureen, <coughs> excuse me, developed this slide to show overall uh, the summary of student performance by objective. This is the average score for all students in each of those objectives. She has noted the proficiency uh, rate cutoff as well as the advanced cutoff. And I, I think what this slide uh, shows us is that we are pretty consistent across the board when it comes to how uh, our students perform on this particular measure. We surpass the state's proficiency rates. And so our conversation is not about proficiency. Our conversation should be about increasing growth, student growth. This is true in both reading and math at the elementary and the middle school level. Again, we are pretty consistent. We, we do what we do well now, but we want to continue to increase. I wanted to look at the data just a little more deeply because those views that you just saw were um, annual scores this you were looking at different groups of kids uh, at the same time every year so the next few slides show the same groups of kids as they have progressed through the grade levels in the green you have the spring 13 uh, results and uh, in spring 13 this this group was in fifth grade and for instance in general reading processes which is you know simply the has to do with how we teach reading, phonemic awareness and phonics, vocabulary acquisition and, and so forth, those basic reading skills. Uh, our kids are strong. They have been. They were strong in the fourth grade. I'm sorry, in the, in the third grade um, where they performed at a level that was proficient. Um, they were strong in the fourth grade again. And uh, even in, in the fifth grade, they, we, as I have said before, we are very consistent in what we do. To me, this says that we do a pretty good job of teaching our kids to read. When we look at that next objective, comprehension of information text, that's how students uh, read and analyze and synthesize uh, information from nonfiction texts. Again, pretty good scores, just a little bit lower than just the reading, the general reading processes. But again, our kids do very well and they have this again same cohort they they're pretty consistent in the next uh, objective the comprehension of the liter literary text same groups of kids still scoring proficient proficient and advanced in third fourth and fifth grade here are these kids as uh, a group of kids who were sixth graders in spring 2013 again you see very little dissonance, there's very little variation in the performance levels of our students. And this is even with the progressively uh, increased rigor that's required of the standards as they move among the grade levels. Um, Dr. Domingue, yes, could I yes, interrupt just a moment? I'm sorry. Um, trying to understand what and I'm not saying it's a mixed message. It could just be my lack of, certainly lack of understanding. Um, but we've understood for several years now that our literacy, our reading, is a big issue in this county. And I guess when I look at these numbers, we're talking about advanced and proficient. And, and when I look at statistically an average I'd like to know about the outliers, the tails, and 
I guess my concern still remains if we're doing a pretty good job of teaching reading, why do we tend to have a, such a large number um, uh, of basic that can't quite learn to read in a, in a time frame that allows them to then ex excel at the rest of their schooling? Can you help me understand why we have this mixed bag of, of uh, effectiveness? I think that, that that's what Ms. Morgovich's slide showed, how we this past year increased in the percentage of students who scored at the basic mm -hmm. level. And that's my uh, cry to our, our county today. That's what we have to work to, to increase, to decrease the percentage of students who are scoring at the basic level. Why does that happen? Well, it may, there's a variety of reasons. And there is a section in the presentation mm -hmm. where we will talk about contributing factors. But um, I'll tell you that we have a variety of um, programs and practices that are happening across the district. and. I think that that has an impact on how well we can do what we do. Um, some very good practices are in place that I have heard from our county level supervisors and from principals. I have not yet seen them in practice in the classroom. Of course, that will be mm -hmm. um, what I will be anxious to see. But simply at first blush, uh, I am uh, concerned about the variety of programming and uh, practices that we have in the district as it relates to reading. Um, we need to be sure that we can implement with fidelity uh, what we do. We need to be sure that we have the capacity to support very well what happens in the classroom. And at this point, I am at a disadvantage because, again, I have not seen it mm -hmm. in the classroom yet. But again, just based on my observations at this time, I would say that that's probably a contributing factor to the variance. And, and what I would just share as a follow-up, um, over the years serving on the board, um, we've often, or not, not often, but uh, infrequently actually looked at a comparison of the different programs that have been made available and as a board member when we were looking at budgeting or cost of the different programs some we, we were products that we paid for um, we were told that we needed different programs for each different type of learning ability so I look forward to some evaluation of all those programs to see if indeed we do need um, that, that type of alignment or if there's one program that can be flexible enough for the teachers to interpret for each child or how that would all work. So um, having so many programs I think has been an issue for a long time. So I think as I, under, as I understand it and, and, and I've been um, learning about these. The programs that we have in place are designed to address different student needs. I just want to be sure that we are implementing them the way that they were designed and uh, that teachers have the support that they need to implement it very well. And that, frankly, schools have the capacity to do that as well. But we've been talking about evaluation mm -hmm. of the programs that we have in place. And that is one thing that's on the radar. Thank you. Um, again, the rest of the slides, and I, I know that you have had uh, the presentation for some time, but again, I, I simply want to emphasize the consistency. And it isn't just in reading. You will see that it is so in math as well. The scores are very close, again, and, and I will tell you, simply because the bars have been turned horizontally, 
it doesn't mean anything. It's just a visual cue for me to uh, know that we're talking about math at this time. But uh, again, same groups of students over time performing um, consistently. Dr. Schmitt? Yes, sir. Back, back to the, um, the reading for a second. If, if I look at the cohorts, grades three through five, four through six, and five through seven, yes, sir. it looks like consistently, I mean, it's very clear in the four through six cohort. Um, the general reading processes, they seem to score the highest. The comprehension of information text is not as high, yes, and the comprehension of literary text seems to be the lowest. Yes. Is that, is that a consistent thing nationwide on these kinds of tests? Is, does that tell us something about where instruction is effective and where it might not be effective? What, what should we make of that? I think that, that tells us that's, that's more complex. General reading processes uh, simply means I'll use the scarlet letter. We put it in the, in the hands of a child. It's a book. And at kindergarten, they understand this is a book. There are pages, there are words, and, and I can get meaning from it. By the time we get to the 12th grade, we expect uh, a student to be able to analyze the ideas in that book, to synthesize and create uh, new ideas that's, that's based on the text. So general reading process, this is basic reading. This is, this is um, um, basic reading comprehension. I can read and I can comprehend. Um, when we get into those standards that deal with comprehension of nonfiction and literary text, then those are those more complex cognitive uh, skills that, that kids need. It's doing something with what you read. It's, it's making something new of the ideas presented, making connections across um, disciplines and, and so forth. So those are more complex processes than just the general reading processes. So I'm not uh, alarmed by that. Um, what I have shared with our staff and what has been shared with them already is that this shows, especially when it comes to compre comprehension of the information text, as we move to PARC and the, um, the uh, common core standards is that we need to teach our children to uh, cognitively manipulate the text, uh, the nonfiction text, the nonfiction readings. They, they need to be um, comfortable in applying and analyzing and synthesizing those texts. So this is not a unique trend to Washington County. It's, again, the progressive Natural part of rigor. learning to read. Correct. Okay. Can Great, I, thank you. Can I dovetail just yes, a little sir. bit on that, Dr. Main? Yes, thank you. Uh, and that was a question that, that, I mean, was something that caught my eye. But this may be simplistic, and I apologize that it is, but, you know, can, can that also be a, a uh, result of uh, a, lack of, a lack of practice, per se, using, you know, literary text or uh, uh, informational text. And can it be, one of the arguments that we've had as a group with, with staff and with other people and amongst ourselves is that we, our, our English textbooks have gone away from, our, and sometimes in, in our English programs in Toto have gone away from reading entire pieces of literature into reading segments. Is it the fact that you know, we don't have the full text and the full uh, piece of literature where we can, you know, follow along and, and build a comprehension of that piece of literature. You know, is that, does that have an impact on it? You understand where I'm coming from? In other words, it, it's one thing to read a, uh, a couple of chapters of a piece of, of, you know, a work of literature. It's another thing to read the whole book and have an opportunity to follow the book as it builds its ideas, as it presents its, you know, uh, message, whatever the case might be. Are we shortchanging our kids and are we putting them in a position that they really have more difficulty comprehending because we're taking shortcuts? In other words, you know, we're, we're giving them a lot of different pieces of literature. We're not giving them as many entire I think that's a great observation, Wayne, and, and one of the things I will tell you is that I think one of the 
benefits of the Common Core, if you will, is actually starting to work with authentic text mm -hmm. as opposed to the anthologies that you're describing, where somebody might read a chapter of a Twain book instead of the whole Mark Twain book. Right. Um, where somebody might read the preamble to the Constitution instead of the entire Constitution. Um, I think that's where you're seeing Dr. Domain and her staff go, is getting more authentic text. And I think this is also a consequence of kind of the dumbing down of reading instruction for kids. And by that I mean this. There is a tremendous movement in this country, an industry, around providing guided reading, which means it's level text. They have actually taken uh, sophisticated algorithms and they have dumbed the language down so that you can read the same book that I might read, but in a simpler version. Fiction mm -hmm. or non? Both. 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 Mm -hmm. it, example is there are software providers today who will say, we're going to give you a piece of nonfiction text but we will give you the text at a 600 lexile. We'll give it to you at an 800, and we'll give it to you at an 1100. And the software is so sophisticated that it will adjust the reading that you'll see to the reading that I'll see to the reading that Wayne will see based on our lexile scores. We'll come out, we'll have roughly the same idea, but you and I will have vastly different vocabulary experiences, we'll have vastly different experiences. So yes, we can talk about this, we can talk about that, we can have a great classroom discussion, but your education was much less risked than mine was. And I think when we begin to see scores like this, we're seeing a bit of a reflection of that. Kind of our education practice over the last 10 to 15 years starting to have a consequence here. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about using authentic text again. Because I think you will see not just our nonfiction libraries grow, but you'll see our, fix, our, our, our friction Fiction. Fiction. Our, might be, be friction, friction. depends. <laughs> um, but our, our fiction collections grow once again as well. And I think librarians across the country um, will actually uh, sing hallelujah. The fact is they won't have as many books, it'll be on a digital resource, but at least they'll have the whole text. So I'm sorry for jumping in, but that's a passion of mine, quite honestly, this guided reading. All right, thank you. Um, again, to return to math, same similar trend. Um, our kids, our kids in general, perform very well, and so our conversation, as I said it before, is is not uh, necessarily one of proficiency. We continue to outpace the state, um, so we are not competing against the state. It's it's really competition against ourselves. We're competing against ourselves to improve the growth of our students and so um, our challenge is to move students to higher rates of proficiency we want fewer basics um, fewer actually proficiency and, and would, would like to grow that advanced uh, performance band that's that's frankly what we would like to have um, and always keeping in mind that again while now we are we're doing pretty well but um, while this level is good we want to be great, and so we want to avoid uh, being comfortable where we are and to develop a cycle of continuous improvement, and that is where uh, we want to be sure we put processes in place to help that happen. I wanted to speak just a few minutes about factors that are impacting the growth, um, that, that may be impacting the growth, first of all, the transition to Common Core this year. Uh, Dr. Wilcox has, always spoke, has already spoken to the fact that you know, there were things um, that were not taught because the MSA requires it, but we were moving to the Common Core curriculum. So this, this uh, misalignment that um, may have happened between the intended curriculum, the tested curriculum, and then the taught curriculum, frankly, may have been a cause for some gaps. And we also know that in this, this district, we aren't doing benchmark assessments um, as frequently as we have done in the past. And so a factor may be that less formal, frequent progress monitoring that is, uh, is not in place and, and frankly is difficult to do with um, learning a new curriculum. And, at every level and then 
so then that leads into the third factor that I believe uh, is impacting the growth. There's a shared learning curve, frankly. County supervisors are digging into this common core curriculum, trying to figure out what it is that the standards actually mean and require and, and really intend for kids to know and do, as well as principals and teachers. So there's a shared learning curve that's happening uh, at this time. Other factors that may be impacting growth, um, I shared with you earlier, just in, com uh, in conversations with our supervisors and with our principals, I have learned that we have um, quite a few uh, instructional practices that are happening in, in buildings. They are good practices, but they do vary from building to building. And uh, with variation becomes a weakening of our capacity to support, to support everything that is going, in, in, uh, going on in every school. So we want to work hard to work on um, uh, shoring up our, our implementation to ensure the effectiveness of what is in place. We want to be sure that uh, our, our teachers and our principals get the professional development to be able to monitor what is in place and to make adjustments as necessary uh, so that, again, what is done is done well and, and we can be sure that we get uh, the best out of it. Another factor impacting growth um, in the area of, I call this instructional leadership, again, we're all in a learning curve starting at the county level. And so uh, as we learn and share with our principals and, and with our teachers, there's just, there, there are gaps that happen because, again, we are all learning this together. And um, I, I believe that as we learn more and get more, about uh, Common Core and Park, um, then we will see uh, some of the gains that, that we're expecting to see from our kids. Here are a few next steps. And I reserve the right, as school goes on, to observe and recalibrate as necessary. So right now, these are the next steps that uh, I have proposed to the team. Uh, we will continue the current strategies that are in place. Again, very um, well selected. We have a very capable team here. And they have selected some solid research-based um, instructional programs and practices that are in place. So we will continue those strategies to accelerate reading achievement. Uh, we as uh, supervisors will monitor the implementation. Again, my goal is to make sure that we're doing correctly or as designed what has been put into place into those schools. We will continue to provide support. Uh, we will be in schools um, to, to offer support as needed to teachers and to principals. We will monitor how our students are progressing and then we will adjust as necessary. We will in adjust uh, instruction. We will, we will modify uh, to make sure that students uh, get what it is that they need. We have similar plans for the area of math. We are going to continue um, professional development for our teachers and our principals. We are working on continuing to build students' fact fluency. I know that uh, our supervisor, Kara Reed, is working very closely with math teachers uh, on, on developing um, practices that will help to do that. Uh, we will expand the use of flex uh, flexible math grouping, and, uh, and I deliberately chose the word expand because, again, from conversations with principals, flexible math grouping is used very well in some schools, not so well in others, but that is a way to uh, respond to, to intervention. Um, we want to see students um, not stuck in an intervention group the entire year when we know that they've gained the skills and they're able to move on. So we want to be sure that we expand the use of that flexible math grouping. Uh, again, we will assess student progress and uh, implement the use of a, there is a computer-based math acceleration program that um, we will use to, again, get students um, build on the skills that they may be weak in or have lacked in order to accelerate them to move 
uh, forward and beyond level. I have made a very deliberate effort to uh, visit every school uh, in our county. I have only four schools left. And in uh, those conversations with principals that I've had, they have asked for some very specific things. Um, they've asked for assistance in continuing to help unpack the standards. We are providing that for them. We will continue to do that. Uh, that conversation will happen not only with the principals, but then also with the teachers, lead teachers, uh, included in that. They have asked for common assessments. And that's an area that we will work on at the county level uh, and then also help to build capacity at the school level. Our, our teachers want to know what is a good measure? What, what is a good question to, to determine whether or not the student has, has met this standard? And so we're talking about ways among the supervisors that instead of having teachers in every building replicate this work, perhaps uh, help them with that, uh, that task, help them develop uh, assessments that we can then use to look at not only where students are in this classroom, but to be able to make that comparison among um, classes in a particular school, and then eventually at the county level. Again, all of this uh, is, is the, the work depends on how the Common Core continues to be rolled out. We want it to be aligned with park, or at least park-like, and so this is a work in progress. Principals have asked for rubrics. They would like to see a standardized rubric to evaluate students' writing. We know that we have some schools that have a um, pretty high student mobility rate, and we want to know that if this teacher rates this work a four, that when they move to the next school, that we are using the same standard to say that, yes, this is indeed a four. So we're, we're looking to uh, and the use of rubrics to evaluate students' writing. And then they've also asked, principals have also asked for content-specific knowledge for teachers and for administrators. I am very glad to report that our principals are instructional leaders. They are not just building managers. They are instructional leaders. And I hear that in their conversations, and uh, especially at the elementary level where our principals and, and teachers are generalists and have to know everything they are asking for that uh, content specific knowledge so that they can help when it comes to curriculum mapping and they can they can provide specific support uh, for that as well for instructional leadership uh, our next steps we will uh, develop job and embedded professional development that includes the county level supervisors we are all learning that's a culture everybody learning uh, we will create support systems such that um, our practices can be done well. We will realign resources, again, making sure that the finances are aligned, that we have the right people in the right places to get this work done, and then communication is key. Um, not only communication among the county level supervisors, but we want to be sure that communication from the county level to schools is also consistent and supportive. So we'll make sure that those are uh, in place. And then finally, um, I thought a lot about uh, this, this culture of continuous improvement and came across this quote that is attributed to Oliver Cromwell. He who stops being better stops being good. We have to continue to uh, improve what we do so that we can see increased learning outcomes for students. That's my goal uh, in coming to the district. Uh, I simply want to be a support and um, be sure that I, I help us get there. So thank you, Dr. Domain. I think you know, the board is going to have some questions or some comments that they'll want to offer. I, I simply would say to you that at the end of the second year of my tenure here, our performance has remained relatively stable. Um, we have seen some uptick in a few areas, but I'm not sure that it is a trend, rather uh, it may be an anomaly right now, um, and, and that's probably true in both directions. Um, you know, I was reminded one time uh, in a previous job where somebody said, well, a year doesn't make a trend. 
So I think we're, we're fast building kind of that base of knowledge that we're going to be able to make some comments like that. Um, but right now, I'm not sure you, we can. I can tell you this, that um, when you track us relative to other counties, we have not lost ground significantly. And in fact, many places we have gained some ground. Um, but what I also have to say to you is, you know, as candidly as I can, is I'm not sure it's because of the general decline in the state or because we've actually stabilized. We, we have not been able to do that analysis yet. Um, I'm confident that we are hiring great people to uh, teach our young people. Um, I've looked uh, almost at every hire this year that has been made in the system. We're hiring people from uh, good colleges and universities who appear to be academically well prepared. Um, but we have, I think, a significant amount to work t to do. Um, it's important for you not to lose sight of one of the things that Dr. Domain said in that our principals are asking for better, deeper content knowledge. We also have teachers who are asking. Uh, it's the first time in my career that I have heard teachers say fairly consistently that they don't want pedagogy, meaning teaching about teaching, they want the content knowledge that goes under it because I think they're beginning to understand that the curriculum is changing going from being a generalist across a whole bunch of things to knowing some things very well. Uh, so I think there's a fundamental shift, but that fundamental shift is also creating a bit of unease within the district. Uh, you've got teachers who are saying, my job is changing around me, you're going to evaluate me differently and I'm teaching a whole different thing. So we're going to do our best to manage all of this, but more importantly, we're going to continue to try to send positive messages to people who are rolling up their sleeves and getting the work done. So, um, you know, I, I would let you ask any questions of Dr. Domain and her team. Uh, I noticed that the math uh, specialist is here, as so is the English specialist, who probably feel weird that their whole discipline has been talked about without them getting to say anything. So <coughs> if you guys want to join us at the table now, we'll have whatever conversation the board would like to have. Dr. Domain, if you will, uh, you know, kind of field the questions and pass them out to your team as you see fit. Yes, sir. Ms. Harshman, sure. I was wondering about two things. One, one is uh, I noticed that it said um, computer, there would be computer support and so on. Are we working to have that available so that it's not a, well, I need it today and you can have it tomorrow and so on because I did a lot of sharing of computers, computer labs and the library when I was teaching and it was not an easy task. It became a monumental problem to get research papers and so on completed when you had no uh, materials with which to do it. That's the first question. Are we working toward a solution to that? Well, I will tell you, in the conversations that I've had with principals, um, I haven't had any who has requested another computer lab. They have worked out ways, uh, especially at the elementary school, they've done that very well. Um, that there are computer labs that they have in place. Um, they are making it work. They have determined um, schedules um, for how classes rotate in and out of the library. And that is not a concern that I've heard from them. I don't know if anyone else on the team has. I, well, I just want to. In, we've added over, I think, 500 PC uh, desktop, excuse me, laptops at middle schools and high schools this summer alone of uh, 500 notebook computers. Um, we're trying to address that need of access at the schools, not for any specific subject area, but I know we spent a significant amount of end of year money uh, to upgrade uh, at the high schools and middle schools, particularly those that have not had access to technology in the past. And I just wanted to let you know, in preparation for PARC, my department is doing an inventory of all of the computers that would be able to be used for online testing. So we're, we're working with technology to make sure that everybody's prepared. So we're going to be doing that this, this month to get that information from the principals. And are we making sure that the um, tests will not overlap with AP and everything else that needs all the same equipment at exactly the same time. Yes, we're, we're working to make sure that the testing calendars aren't overlapping. <laughs> okay, and the other, the other question I had was um, with, with more stringent 
um, knowledge needed by elementary teachers for specific areas, are we moving toward a departmentalized elementary? Is that? There are some elementary schools, some principals that I've talked to, and they are departmentalized at the upper levels, fourth and fifth grade specifically. But that is not a trend across the district. If I can add to that, um, you know, it's, it is difficult as an elementary teacher to be a generalist. Um, but it's also really important that you have a grasp for all the contents because it's really important to be able to make those connections for students. Um, for example, in math, how can we make those connections between what we learned in math to what we're doing in science. So there are advantages and disadvantages to departmentalizing and to being a generalist. So it's our job to, how do we, how do we build that content knowledge um, for our teachers and then support them in making those connections. Um, and then I also wanted to go back to your question about computers. Oh, yeah. Was that based on that computer, that math bullet? Um, Yes, uh, yes. Okay, yes. to go back to that, um, that was kind of a partnership with our special ed team and the math team as far as looking at that computer-based program. And as part of that, um, special ed, in addition to the computers, PCs, and laptops that have been purchased, special ed has also purchased some particular, speci specifically to be used for that purpose. So there isn't that, um, scheduling issue with computer labs in schools. Okay, it, it was based on seeing that there, but it really was based on knowing that there's always a problem with mm -hmm. every department needing computers and access to materials. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Harshman, then I'll come to you, Ms. Fisher. Ms. Harshman, yeah, oh. and then Williams. Ms. Williams. That's Mrs. Harshman. Williams. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Mrs. Harshman. <laughs> Mrs. Williams, and then Mrs. Fisher. I'm sorry. You confused me. <laughs> I understand why. <laughs> um, my question is, is this the only MSA information that we will be receiving as a board? Is, is this, this, this presentation, is it? There are others. I guess what I, I was hoping for was some more disaggregated data in terms of information by school. I want to know, Mrs. Um, Brightman, express a concern about those students who are in the pink part of the bar who are at basic and you know I want to give a face to those students I want to know where they are Are those students in our city schools are they in our county schools are they dispersed evenly across our district um, in terms of subgroup you know who, who are these kids that that are consistently in this basic range that we're not able to move into proficiency or into advance. So my question, I guess, is, is this it? This is all we're going to do with MSA, or will there be more disaggregated data coming our way? I think we can provide, I think we can provide some summary information. I'd be hesitant to provide simply spreadsheets. Okay. Uh, but we can provide some summaries. I mean, you provide an executive summary to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Cox, I don't think your mic's on. It doesn't work anymore. Oh. Oh. I don't think it works anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the red light is on. Oh, it flashes. And this one doesn't work. You may have so, there, so there's the possibility. I didn't turn it off. It's on. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh -huh. so, so, there, so there's the possibility for more information coming our way. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll send some more, uh, but um, it's just recasting what you've seen, so we'll send it. Um, my other question then deals with um, the principal's requests. I was just wondering how those would be prioritized or have they been prioritized? Are they in priority here and then um, you know, how, how are they going to be addressed simultaneously? Um, you know, I just Simultaneously. wondering. Simultaneously. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has to be done yesterday. <laughs> and with a sense of urgency, right? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but actually the, the work, this is work that has already begun. So it, this isn't starting from scratch. Uh, I, I guess this is confirmation for the work that this team has already done. They have been working with teams uh, even over the summer to unpack 
the standards, I mean, literally looking at the nouns and the verbs and the standards to figure out what they mean. Um, so again, this is work that has already begun. We will continue it, and all of this is priority. My question is going to follow up Ms. Harshman's. Um, going back to computer use within the schools, can the, do we know if the park tests, if we can take them on tablets, or does it have to be a full-fledged computer? iPads have been enabled already. Mm -hmm. um, they? They're working on Android devices as well. Have we, I know we've put iPads in elementary schools. Do we have iPads in any of the high schools or middle schools? Because that would be a cheaper way to add more capacity computer program. well right now we just have to offer a lot of different things the honestly the laptop price that we're getting right now is about six hundred dollars a new iPad is about six hundred dollars um, when you add air watch and all the things that you have to add to it so we're adding kind of a healthy mix but we also don't want to be dependent on any one technology um, but yes you're, you see iPads at high schools you see iPads at middle schools um, you see a lot of the Lenovo notebook computers now that are being uh, distributed as well. Okay. And my other question goes back to that um, last item under the math box on page 13 with the implementation and the use of computer-based math. It's, are they programs that we presently own or is this something that we're looking to purchase? It has been purchased. It has been purchased. Mm -hmm. The software. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just um, a no, couple. Oh, no, Sprite, go ahead. sure. I know there's always a temptation to get down in the weeds, and I'm a non-educator, so be patient with me. But, and I promise not to do too many of those before I ask a couple board-level uh, questions. On your factors impacting growth page, and there, I don't have a page number right off on my hard copy, but you mentioned variation among instructional practices as, and if I'm understanding, as a cause, possible cause of lack of growth or some confusion. My understanding of common core rigor is that teachers would be given some flexibility as to how they delivered the material or instruction that they were going to be given that opportunity to adjust the content to a student or group of students or the class. So I'm sort of seeing variation maybe as a good thing rather than a negative. So I, I want to be sure in my mind that the Common Core isn't going to restrict the teachers, and so I'd, I'd like some response to that concern. You, you are correct. There, teachers do have the flexibility, and what is happening in um, some of our schools that I've seen is, for example, curriculum mapping, where units of instruction or are sequenced uh, according to that particular school. And so in, in one school, you may see a particular sequence of, of units, but that may not be what you see when you go to the next school, the school that's, that's down the street. And it's due to the flexibility that teachers are given. Um, it's probably due to the, the recursive nature of what's being taught as well, the standards. That the, you, you don't cover a standard and then move to the next standard and we're completely done. So there is flexibility in, in content and you know when and how things are taught, which is a good thing for a teacher. However, at the county level, such as myself being new, coming in, trying to figure out what's happening where, it's hard to to really grasp what is happening everywhere when so many different things <laughs> are, are happening in places. And so it's having to have a team that has to uh, know everything and, and know um, when um, 
uh, units of instruction are, are happening in places so that we can adequately resource them. Um, a science example, since Sandy's in the room, uh, there may be a school that decides to do uh, a unit on dissection that may happen within the first nine weeks and another school that has it in the third nine weeks and we've provided resources for that to happen in the second nine weeks. So there are just some uh, logistical okay. things that happen at okay. the county level in resourcing and providing support that happens as a result of the flexibility that is given. So, so there are a couple of other things too. You know, one of the topics that we talk about is programs that are purchased in the district. Um, I don't think teachers have a flexibility once a program is purchased to pick and choose how they use the program. For example, uh, I used to work for a company that sold a billion dollars worth of a program that was researched, designed, and developed to improve reading comprehension. Um, but it came with all the resources that were needed to deliver that in a scientifically uh, managed way. And if you did it that way, I, I will tell you, you got results. And typically the results you had were better than what were advertised because that was kind of the secret of the sauce in the marketing. On the flip side of that, there were districts all across the country who said, well, you know what, I don't need to use the reading portion of that program. I'm going to let kids read the newspaper during that time for their current events class. Or I'm not going to have the small group instruction where I actually am teaching reading and they exercised a degree of flexibility that meant that we had no fidelity of implementation of the model. So we got no results. In fact, in some of the studies that we did, we were actually worse off for having used the model than we, we just had a traditional classroom teacher. So we have to take a look at flexibility in terms of model adoption differently than we do in terms of course development. Let me kind of walk that a little bit through, through a little bit further. It's very important to me that when we teach Algebra One Common Core Edition, that by the end of the year, I can say that this student has mastered these concepts. I don't really care that they mastered concept one before concept three or concept four before concept five, although in math, there is a bit of a hierarchy that you kind of have to, right? But I'm just saying, I, I don't really care. If, if a teacher can teach it that way and kids can learn it, then I'm all for it. But if you can't do it because it defies logic, then no, you don't get that flexibility. Uh, another reason for us to have a curriculum that is roughly headed west is because we have a mobility issue in this community. Kids move between and among our schools. If kids move and teachers have so much flexibility that we create holes for the kids in terms of their knowledge base, we haven't done them a great service. But I will tell you that the conversation that Dr. Do Domain and I have had repeatedly is we cannot be so prescriptive that we suck the life out of teaching. Thank you. There has to be artistry in how the teacher teaches. For example, there are many great novels that an English teacher can use to teach a perspective that is called upon in demonstrating success on a test. You know, we don't have to say that it is this classic or this classic. The teacher ought to make that decision based on the kids. That's why Dr. Domain is saying we've got to be able to resource that. So again, it helps to know because I can't buy a classic collection of books for every kid in the system, but I can move them around. To, to follow up, and, and great answer. It helps me understand that sensitive balance, but isn't the evaluation and the assessments, don't those act as a barrier to that flexibility and creativity? Don't they tend to put that burden where is a teacher going to be willing to take a risk, to ask the children to take a risk, to have that type of of uh, creative exchange and synergy in the classroom if, if this thing is hanging, I, I'm just, well, I that's think where I, I'm concerned. I think, I, think the, I think the direct answer is yes. I mean, how experimental are you gonna be if you know that your job depends on it? Yeah. So, but I, I will tell you that we have repeatedly said, I think Mike Marco and others who have been with me 
have heard me say a hundred times to our administrators that our assessment systems are not I gotchas. We are not going to go into a classroom time after time and say, you're ineffective as a teacher because I didn't see all 144 of these behavior traits, these process traits in your class today. We're going to use these models as coaching models. Uh, we're going to work hard to help make teachers better teachers. Again, I understand until we do that, it's just words coming from the superintendent or words coming from a principal. Um, but we really have little choice to have an assessment system. I mean, state law says that we have to evaluate teachers. Did our old model work? I would say there were probably as many complaints about our old model as I've already heard about our new model. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that this whole assessment of classroom teachers is a very, very difficult topic for all of us. And ultimately, it's not my words to your ears. It's what happens in 46 different schools by about 100 different administrators with 1,700 teachers. And I, I will tell you, I cannot design a system that will satisfy a teacher who gets a bad evaluation from a teacher, from a principal, because they're going to say there was personality in it or that the, or that the metrics were flawed. I can't, we can't design a single system. So what we've tried to do in this process is design a system that has some balance and fairness, but I will tell you, we may have over-engineered, but we only know that until once we get there. Um, it, it, you know, my, my wife just gained her certification in teaching, and this will be my last comment on this. Um, she, has, she had been a classroom teacher for 20 years, and when we uh, last moved, well, in Florida, she decided to be a stay-at-home mom. And I teased her about getting her certificate renewed in Florida, and I teased her even more when she got her certificate renewed in New Jersey, and I laughed at her when she applied to get it in Maryland, because I said, why would you want to do this? Now, think about that for a superintendent of schools to his wife. <laughs> and I did that because what I shared with her is the world of teaching is so different today than it was not 10 years ago, not five years ago, but for our teachers last year. Now, Julie has gotten her certification and she wants to teach again, and I told her good luck in Frederick, I heard they're hiring. <laughs> um, <'cause laughs> um, but you know, my, my point is simply this, a real tough conversation, and not about I don't value education, I absolutely do. But is that where you want to make your living given this very difficult assessment system this accountability system that really acts, I think, Don, to your point, as a damper on some teachers who want to be experimental. But I, I'm saying to you, once again, for the thousands of percent, that is not the way we want this assessment system to be used. Um, we are going to do our best to make sure that it isn't. But I will bet dollars to dimes or dimes to dollars, however the phrase works best, that each of you within the next six months will have a teacher come and say, that we had a system designed to penalize them. And you'll come back to me and say, I told you so. I already told you that. Hmm. Wayne tells me that nearly every day <laughs> today. <laughs> and we haven't even done it once yeah, yet. Right. So, yeah, I, all right. I'll back on what Dr. Wilcox said about the changing world for teachers and education. And we had a conversation not long ago. There are 25 superintendents in the state of Maryland, including the state superintendent. Dr. Wilcox is the fourth longest tenure. Now think about that turnover and, and how the changes in the yes. state are having a churn not just for teachers and principals, but for the, the leadership of the state in education. So I just wanted, wanted to add that. It's never been harder, I'll tell you that. It is interesting though, the, the I, state, when state law was written, you know, as far as the evaluations is concerned, our biggest concern was the the percentage that was going to be used from assessments. That doesn't bother me nearly as much as the other stuff, because uh, you know, Doctor Meat, you'll probably hear me say this to you a hundred times, as I've already said it to him. The second part of that still worries me, because we've been told by the state that you will use one model of teaching. I've heard from, from HR in our last HR meeting, 
we have videos out there going to show what exceptional teachers are. Well, what those videos will show, what are exceptional teachers using the Charlotte Danielson model? You know, and, and I don't think the law said that. You know, the law said, the law was talking about assessments, teachers being evaluated based on student performance. Didn't say a thing about, you know, one model being used for classrooms. So when you say flexibility, I can understand the when. The how, I don't see, I, that still worries me because I don't know that teachers are going to feel the flexibility to do different things just as everybody has said. What Donna said and Justin said, I don't think they're going to feel that comfort to try something that might be outside of, you know, what Charlotte Danielson has prescribed as, you know, great teaching, great teaching model. So, oh, I just look forward to hearing this all year. Mr. Bailey wanted to get in. I I'm sorry, just, Paul. just wanted to comment that uh, I was pleased to hear the superintendent say that uh, the hundred so new faces coming in he feels pretty comfortable with them, or at least in the interview process has gained a feeling that uh, they're prepared for what they're going to, to face. My question, I guess, is, uh, is that indicative of our teacher training institutions within the state or around the country? Are they preparing candidates for teaching uh, to be prepared for teaching a common core curriculum. The answer My experience when I came out, I was not prepared. I, I think it's fair to say that teachers aren't prepared to teach the common core um, because what a lot of folks, I think, struggle with is they say the common core curriculum and they think that there's this book where the curriculum is. The, the fact is common core is a set of standards and the curriculum is defined by teachers at local school districts. Um, so to be direct to your answer, Mr. Bailey, is no, they're not. But what I am seeing today from colleges of education are kids who have more, more expertise in a specific subject area than they've had in, say, the past 10 or 15 years. Um, there are fewer pedagogy classes at the college level, more content level. So when we hire an elementary teacher, they have a, an additional math or science course. Or if we hire a science course, they have an additional English course to complement their subject area discipline. So we're seeing some of that. Okay. Uh, in wrapping up, wrapping up my comments, I, I would like to make the people in this room who are involved with this every day feel uh, a little better because in my experiences, I came through what was called a common, uh, not a common, but the core curriculum mm -hmm. area. I was exposed to that. Then I had Project Basic. Then I had Back to the Basics. And then I had the Admiral Rickover mm -hmm. report. And we survived all of those, and we will survive this. And my prediction is that we will compete well against uh, our, our count, counties in the state of Maryland and across the United States. I absolutely feel very confident in that. Thank you. My comments. Mrs. Fisher. Um, I absolutely agree with the mobility problem that occurs in this county and, and I realize in English, for instance, we can share sets of scarlet letter between schools so you can be teaching it during a different time, but I cannot imagine every 11th grade English class teaching the research paper at the same time in this county. There are not enough libraries <laughs> for that to work. We don't have a library. Right no. Now. No, because the kids take anything they can find on that and accept it as fact and truth without checking into it. That's part of our job, though, isn't it? To teach them that they've got to be sophisticated I think that's consumers. a task that has n the teachers aren't doing. We, we have not. They don't have time, I don't think. You're right. To teach them how to find authentic material on that internet. I think that that's a very good point, point. Um, and that's one of the challenges we're finding today in curriculum is that um, the vetting of resources, whether they be traditional paper resources or electronic resources, is becoming a greater and greater challenge for our teachers. Um, Dr. Nguyen and I have actually have a, a conversation uh, about this, and one of the things that we talk about is 
what does the supervisor's role look like in the future? Uh, my sense is the supervisor's role is going to look very different in the future because they are going to become the curators of great resources for teachers who are so busy with kids that they don't have time to find these things. Um, so, you know, you, you can look at Beth and Kira today and say, gosh, you are probably the last of a generation of folks who are masters of multiple trades. Sooner or later, they will be like research librarians providing materials to people in the schools through portals that they maintain and wikis that they lead. Oh, you do some of that already. <laughs> That's also why I have a problem, what I said before, with other disciplines at the high school level teaching or requiring a research paper because they don't teach the process of doing the research paper and kids will get it done any way they can, say for a science teacher or a history teacher, and they're learning bad habits of how to do research because those other teachers don't have the time to teach how to authenticate what you're using as a resource. More that they have the time to check into it when they grade the paper if they what's done Williams, right. Williams, I got it right this time. <laughs> yes, you did, thank you. Um, we, we've talked a lot about these summative assessments, the one that, that we're going to be saying goodbye to soon, and the, and the one that's uh, right there on the horizon that's uh, big and scary for us. And I guess I'm wondering, I, I myself see, if I were in the classroom, and had the flexibility to integrate and do everything that I needed to do to teach the Common Core. I'm thinking in terms of formative assessments, how difficult that must be because, because of the flexibility, because of the uh, need to integrate and the fact that the teachers are going to be doing that differently. So. I guess my question then becomes, what are we doing to monitor the progress? What can we do in lieu of benchmarks that we've used to help us monitor our progress towards MSA? What, what's, what's in store for our teachers now in terms of formative assessment? I'm smiling because we've been having <laughs> that discussion. <laughs> that discussion. So that's but another airplane that's that in the works. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for the plans. Okay. <laughs> We, we are uh, actually, um, I believe that Beth and e ELA and uh, Kira, I believe, also has, they've been working on building um, good questions, uh, assessment items that, that cross uh, disciplines. And, but again, that's, that's the challenge. As you said, that's the challenge of the flexibility. We would like to have that available um, for teachers. Teachers right now, according to principals, are doing that at the school level. We high grade level? They're doing that yes. high grade? Okay. Yes. Uh, again, according to principals. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I know that the two of you have been in schools and may have seen some of this work. But that's some of what we are trying to calibrate at this level. One, I don't want teachers to have to do that. Um, it's, it seems duplication of effort mm -hmm. so if there's something that we can do to make them you know to, to help them spend their time more efficiently mm -hmm. then we'd like to do that but that's ongoing conversation with us it's uh, well, I think the other challenge. thing the other thing that we're using right now is that we're using the Descartes which is produced by the map assessments which uh -huh. we're giving three times a year uh -huh. so that's helping us to kind of look at what a student needs and then individualize their education it's giving teachers, I think, that um, understanding of where kids are. Um, the real question for us is, what do we do at the high school level right now? Because we don't have anything that's similar uh, at the high school level. Um, so I, I think there probably will be some through course progress monitoring devices that they come up with. But I will tell you, I will resist with every fiber of my bones, within my bones, the return to the past, which is the quarterly or every six week benchmark assessment mm -hmm. um, that any teacher will likely teach to, mm -hmm. um, which narrows our, our curriculum mm -hmm. and I think stifles creativity in a way that um, is really counterproductive for kids. So uh, I know that they're working on some great cross discipline uh, assessments that's really I think the wave of the future and then the question really becomes 
how frequently do they administer it, how quickly do they get results back, and what does it mean for kids in terms of changed instruction. Um, so that, that's kind of the push that I will give them when I get to sit down with them. You used a phrase that I was going to use as we got towards wrapping this up. But the, the factors impacting growth and the discussion about what's being tested and what's being taught and the change in curriculum. I know I got that on back to school night with my son last year when it was, look, you're in um, seventh grade math. Next year, you're going to have to take Common Core Algebra. So the curriculum you're going to get this year is going to be different. And it was tough for parents to mm. understand, let alone parents who aren't on the board. Um, but they were very clear about that. And one of the things that I think the results show uh, for anybody who I think wants to think about it is that in this county, we don't teach to a test. Because if we taught to a test, my son wouldn't have had that experience. Those teachers would have been there saying, this is the test you're going to have in the spring. This is what I'm going to test you in this classroom. And I want to thank, frankly, the superintendent, the supervisors, uh, the principals and the leaders for having the courage to do that because it's right by kids. Knowing that, we might be sitting here with MSA scores that are lower than they were the year before. But I think it's precisely because there was a conscious choice made in this county to move forward with what we're going to have to do for the long run rather than teach to a test in the short run so that we can put our scores where we might think they ought to be. Um, and, and finally, to bring this back, I mean, as we all talk about it on the global level as schools or as a system, I'm sure these results are being discussed at the school level by principals, by the supervisors. What advice would you give um, Dr. Domain to a parent who now sees an MSA test where their child looks like they've fallen back? What would you tell that parent for those students because I, there are going to be a lot of parents if they haven't already found the results on performance matters who are going to go back for the first day of school get the MSA results from last year and say wow my child was advanced in both subjects last year and now they're only proficient what what advice would you give that that parent I would remind the parent that we are in a period of transition when it comes to what is being taught and what is being tested that um, while we want our, our students to and parents to be aware of where students are performing on measures that they are given that that is only one measure that is not currently uh, aligned to what we are doing it is not currently aligned to the curriculum that they should monitor what students are doing in class um, they should talk to their children about what they are learning, um, that they should uh, be sure that they are abreast of uh, how students are performing in that class on, on assignments and, and, and um, with the, the grades that they earn at, at the end of each marking period, and have constant uh, communication with the teacher. Then the next measure that comes out should be more reflective of what their student, their child has learned. And that's, that's sort of the advice I gave to one parent, which is no, none of these assessments is going to necessarily tell you as much about your child as a good conversation with a principal, a teacher, and the people who work with your child every day. Mm -hmm. So if you think that any child's success is reduced to a number on a test, that's shortchanging the student, and it's also shortchanging the instructors who spend their time getting to know and teach, teach that child. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you're exactly right. Well, take care. So. Mrs. Harshman will take one or Two more okay. questions I before we move to our next subject. One thing I wanted to clear up, and that was, um, will we then receive, uh, as Mrs. Williams requested, a school-by-school school, um, listing of the... No, I will, you, can, you can get that at the Maryland website if you would like to pull that out, MSDE. Mm -hmm. um, I'll send you a summary of it. Okay. So. I, I think, I, and I, I, does that sound like, no, I won't give it to you. you I can print it for you if you want, but it would be much easier for you to have it. In so I'll send you the link so that you can okay, go get I'll send fine. you the link. That'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other quick questions on this topic? It, Mrs. This is hopefully quick. Also on the instructional leadership, Dr. Domain, you spoke about realigning resources from a board level that, that flags that as a budget discussion. 
um, will there be something, are we realigning the same amount of money? Will we need additional money? Is it going to be redeployed? What kind of recommendations might be coming from instruction and curriculum to the board and superintendent level as a recommendation? I'll take a first pass and then Dr. Sure. Domain if you want to. Um, to the extent that we would ask for additional resources, that would come before the board. Mm -hmm. If we were going to purchase something uh, ex in excess of $50,000, that would come to the board. Um, if it is simply reallocating resources from one fund to another, um, you probably wouldn't see that because that would just be a budget adjustment that we would make. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that that's correct. Uh, I'm not asking for additional funds. That's where I was wondering if we needed to anticipate that discussion going forward. Thank you. Well, I'm, unless there are any more questions or comments, I'd like to thank Dr. Wilcox for arranging to have this presentation for all of us. Uh, and thank the board members for a good discussion. And, and you're always welcome, excuse me, Justin, um, to, to step up either, if, whether you're on the curriculum committee or not, if you want to visit with Dr. Domain about these, re these, these results, please don't hesitate. R Rick and um, Matt are also great resources if you want to talk about specific school performance um, so you know what's happening there. Um, but I would encourage you to begin with Dr. Domain and then she'll bring Rick and Matt into the conversation. Okay. We're, we're next going to have a brief discussion on mission vision. Do you mind taking 10, 10 minutes? We need to wrap the next discussion up by 11.30. So that'll still give us almost a half hour. So we'll come back in 10 minutes. Okay. Sounds good.